The druggie pulled an object about a centimeter out of the inner pocket of his tattered gray jacket. He stopped as a bullet crashed into his skull and exploded his brains all over the rare Kalushian pillows on display behind him. He could have picked a better spot to stand, thought Jason, mourning his ruined product. The door swung open. A girl in her teens ran inside, her eyes wide with shock. When she saw the body on the shop's floor, her eyes grew even wider. Father, she screamed. Father, no! She fell onto the body and began to weep into its chest. No, she screamed. No, 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 this isn't happening, no! Confused and wondering if he should be horrified, the shopkeeper looked around the store as if searching for some explanation to this girl's presence sitting on his shelves. I don't... he began, but he didn't know how to finish the sentence. Why? she pleaded, looking at him, red-faced and teary-eyed. Why? He had a gun! yelled Jason, more defensively than he'd meant to. No, he didn't, she screamed. Her sadness had turned to fury. In his hand, he said, pointing to the dead man's arm, still tucked in his jacket. The girl lifted the jacket's flap to reveal the object which her father had been clutching. It was a miniature statue of Brilla, much like those Jason kept in his display window facing the street. In fact, it bore a striking resemblance to the one that was stolen from him yesterday. He was going to return it and ask forgiveness, she screamed. He was going to quit. He was going to be my father again. There are moments in life when everything suddenly loses all solidity. Moments when the heart packs its bag and relocates to the throat and beats hard enough to deafen you. Jason had one of those moments when he understood what he had done. Everyone thought he was going to, he said meekly. He looked like he was going to. I thought it was him or me. Shut up, she yelled. She was rocking back and forth with the body of the man who had been her father in her arms. This was too much. Jason had killed Dee Dee junkies before, but all of them had been armed, and none of them had had beautiful young girls weeping over their corpses afterwards. I'd better call the Strodkers, he said, dialing their extensions into the viewer atop his counter. They'll know what to do. The Strodkers arrived a few minutes later, and after hearing both accounts and viewing the H-Docs of the event, they determined that the misunderstanding, while unfortunate, was understandable. Jason was told to be more careful in the future, and the girl, whose name was Sorella, was offered condolences and a ride home, both of which she refused. As she walked through the bustling crowds of merchants and tourists that frequented New New Orleans, she felt horribly misplaced. She wished that the streets weren't so vibrant and alive with millions of people from hundreds of unique cultures. She wished that they were instead an empty alleyway, littered with garbage and travailed only by the hopeless. Those were the streets she walked in her heart and in her soul. Life, she bitterly reflected, not noticing the group of Rendarian warlords gathered in a circle a few yards in front of her, conversing angrily. This is an unnecessary adverb, since Rendarians do everything angrily. Her father had once been a good man with a good life, he had a job as a logistics analyst at the Impera Corporation, a mid-size apartment, a gold-level transport pass, three loving wives, and more children than he knew what to do with. Sorella recollected her father's face before the years of death dust abuse had sapped it of its kindness and turned him from a gentle and loving parent and husband into a hateful cauldron of rage, ever threatening to boil over, scalding those around him. His eyes had been crystal blue then, and full of that iron brand of compassion that tragically few men possess. The night before, he'd shown up at her apartment, shaking violently and weeping tears pink with the hint of blood. I'm so sorry for what I put you through, he told her. I never meant it. What are you doing here, she asked, skeptical of his junky tears. I told you to never come here again. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just... You... You were the only one who kept believing in me. When everyone else had abandoned me, you still believed. It meant something to me. Even then, it still means something. I'm not giving you any money, she told him, forcefully. I don't want any, he said, shaking his head. I don't want any money. I just want to get help. There was a great long silence between them then. She looked into the man's yellow eyes and even though they looked nothing like the blue eyes of her father, she saw an honesty and desperation there that every junkie learns how to fake. 
and she could never learn how to not believe. Come in, she said, knowing she'd regret it. It was hours later, after he'd napped on the floor of the kitchen den, that he presented to her with the Brilla statue. I stole it, he said, from that fine furniture store, a side case zigzag from here, the one with the big wooden sign, like it's all old times, good times. You kemp it, I. Jason's shops, he said. Aye, it's that one. I took it from there, I did. Stole it. Figured I could make a dozen creds off it, maybe, you camp. But then I took a look at it, I started thinking, remembering. Remembering all the times my dad and I used to pray to Brilla. I thought about a lot of things. I ain't sure exactly what my conclusions I came to. But I know I can't live like this no more. I can't go on feeling and living like an animal all the tick-tock. Well, she said, after a long moment's consideration, the first thing to do is return the statue. Damn her. Damn her and her stupid advice. If she hadn't told him that nonsense, he'd still be alive instead of lying partially headless in a depository somewhere. She began to cry again. What is this? snarled a huge voice. You walk through our circle as if it were your own private gateway. Oh, hell, she thought, realizing what she'd just done. She'd passed through the center of a Rendarian circle. It was an awesome gesture of disrespect, and it would not be taken lightly. She saw each of the monstrous warlords in their innate uniforms were staring at her with a hatred and disgust so absolute that she almost literally felt it crawling on her skin like a troop of maggots. She knew that explaining herself would be pointless. Rendarians forgave nothing. Her best chance was to run. Her only chance was to run. They were fat and slow, but crowds would clear for them. She darted away as fast as her legs could carry her, thankful for the comfortable shoes on her feet. If she'd chosen a pair of dress shoes that morning, she'd have lost the race before ever leaving the gate. You cannot escape, human! shouted the biggest and ugliest and highest ranking of them. I can damn sure try, she thought.